is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Hannah's not here today. She had a minor dental surgery, so she's taking the old day off. And uh, we're so glad, though, that you're with us wherever you are. Haven's going to be assisting me in worship today, so thank you, Hey. Always nice to have, a, like, a friend ready to help. So, anyway, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you love us and you care for us. And we pray in Jesus' name that today your Holy Spirit will do a good work in our hearts. We gather here for you to lift up your name. We also know, God, that you want to encourage us. Teach us what it means to walk in your ways. So we ask for all these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. for the message, Mark 2, 15 through 17. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners with him and his disciples, for they were who followed him. When the teacher of law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Amen. Shadow. 
Hannah and I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today, and we hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Several years ago, I began practicing the Creed of the Beloved by saying it aloud each day, and now it's become a vital part of the walk that I have with the Lord. Though simple, these words have changed me from the inside out and given me renewed vision, joy, and energy. Every week on Our Power, we recite the Creed, which says, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me, I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it away from me. I don't have to worry, I don't have to hurry, I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. And that's the truth, dear friend. By resting in the Lord's boundless and unconditional love, you will experience the fullness of his blessings. When you embrace your position as his beloved child, you will be empowered to step into your true identity, to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow his call on your life. Though it's not magic, practicing this creed changed the dial on my life one degree at a time. Well, I didn't notice like a huge difference at first, as I regularly trained and aligned my mind with the Word of God, I developed a deep sense of rootedness and contentment. And I believe this can happen to you too. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we wanna send you this Creed of the Beloved bookmark. As you meditate on the truths it contains, we believe it has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. Write to Hour of Power, New Zealand, P.O. Box 26209, Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. You can tap into the energy, power, and joy that comes from living in the kingdom of God when you walk every day in your identity as His beloved. As always, we're extremely grateful for your friendship and we're continually praying for you. God loves you and so do we. Deidre Pujols is an activist and founder of the Pujols Family Foundation, which serves the Down Syndrome community in very tangible ways. In 2016, she founded Open Gate International, which stemmed from her passion for cooking and her desire to make an impact in the world. The organization teaches culinary skills and provides invaluable job training to survivors of human trafficking, while also helping them to get into the workforce. OpenGate is not only operating in the U.S., but is expanding in other parts of the world. Please welcome Deidre Pujols. So glad to have you in the Thank house. You. Thank you very, very much. Well, for those 
who don't know a lot about how you started at all of this, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Sure. Um, well, in 2016, I was invited to take a trip to Mexico City and visit an organization called El Pozo de Vida, and it's run by a friend of mine named Benny, and he has safe homes for young, young ladies who were being rescued from trafficking, and he has several other programs as well for, for ladies. So I went, and um, there was a seed planted in me that I just had to, you know, find out more. So I was learning about human trafficking for the first time, and I was seeing things that I had never seen before. And, and it was a problem for me, so I wanted to learn more. So I took all of 2016 to really travel around the world and study and learn as much as I could about human trafficking. And we hear about it, of course, but you actually saw these things. What were some of the things that you saw that, you know, as a believer, you were just like, I have to do something about this? Um, that's a great question, because one of the most, um, and, like, moments that, w or multiple times that I've had this, this experience, but watching um, the women who prostitute in Mexico on a, um, in an area, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of women that kind of, like, line up on multiple blocks. And when I look at the women, and I know what God says about them and what he thinks about them, like your heart will break mm -hmm. for, for them. And so that really was like, I remember that kind of a moment for me was just not, it's just wrong. Like I can't let her stand there. Um, but the interesting thing about that is no matter how much you tell them how great they are, even pray with them there on the street, even maybe they shed a tear, you'll see them right back there the next night. So you start to realize, okay, wait, you can't just pat somebody on the back and tell them they're great. Like, we have to do something different that gets their heart to change, not just their behavior. So that's kind of the things for me that really was, you know, impressed upon my heart. It's, it's an interesting how often I've actually met or gotten letters from prostitutes who are Christians that watch Hour of Power. And for me, the first time that happened, it was a disconnect, you know, like how can you, how can it be both? Mm -hmm. And what you're seeing is they don't have a way out. Mm -hmm. And so they really feel stuck or they, they feel too scared to leave. A lot of times they're in danger. And so your organization really is, is trying to help, and you are helping in a big way with that. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so let me pack like the last four years in a really short time. Yeah. Basically what happened is as I traveled, one of the things that I saw that was missing from um, the efforts fighting human trafficking was an opportunity to get individuals who have been rescued and who have been rehabilitated back into a, sus a sustainable and thriving life. So I thought, well, what can we do to help that? So I, at the end of my travels around the world, I shared with you before that I really sat down with God and had to have him show me what would I do, because this is global, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. How could my one little life impact in this effort? And I began to put my passions of culinary arts and my love for business together and created this culinary school. But what happened was there's this gap that needed to be filled out there in the field, and that was with job training and mm -hmm. workforce reintegration, getting people back into jobs. In addition, because people are coming from traumatic backgrounds and um, just brokenness, we have to be able to put the person back together first. Mm -hmm. um, well, Jesus really does that, but we help them navigate yeah. to that. So we created a life skills program, and we created a culinary program, and together we tried to holistically bring the person back into identity, into purpose, into value, and teach them culinary skills, and then we put them back into to work. Mm -hmm. So that's what Open Gate International is. It's amazing. So you help them get work, and you help them learn how to cook good food. Right. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I love it. I, I, and one thing a lot of people forget is that People who are in, in the sex industry a lot of times have kids, mm -hmm. and they don't want to be doing what they're doing, but they're like, I have to meet my kids' needs. I can't, I don't know how to mm -hmm. do this other stuff. And so you're helping them realize that there, there can be another path for them, and I, I think that's, I don't know, this is really awesome. Um, what encouragement can you give, like, even if there's people right now who are watching that are being trafficked. I was surprised to learn a lot of, I always think of human trafficking as a sexual thing, mm -hmm. but a lot of times it's, in other countries especially, it's workers, there's yeah. workers that are just not paid that are like basically slaves. Right, right. What encouragement do you give to anybody who's watching right now and they feel just completely trapped in something like that? Yeah, well, first of all, um, 
vulnerability, people in, um, in poverty, people in um, bad family situations, bad finance situations, will oftentimes feel like their only option is to um, do something like uh, trafficking and whatever. There's 27 different types of categories of trafficking, so mm -hmm. it just tells you how vast that industry can be. And they look, they're all different forms. So I think if somebody's watching and they're stuck, um, f first, the most important thing I could tell you is I promise you that is not the life that God made you to have. Yeah. Um, he's a good God. And by my own testimony and where I came, how I came up and how my husband came up, I know that I know that, that God has something better. Um, so there, are help, there is help out there. We have national hotlines that help people these days and um, different ways to help. So getting a hold of the help is the most important thing. But making sure that you know how incredibly important out of 8 billion people that your life is, is the first thing. Yeah. Um, so that, among, that would be like where I would help the Holy Spirit would come in and, and do the rest of the work. But I mean, I have watched lives be transformed before my very eyes of mm -hmm. people who didn't value their life before and how they felt about themselves after we got a hold of them. And I know that I know transformation can be real. That's right. Amen. Well, and I love what you said, too, that, that at the heart of it is believing that in that mix of 8 billion people that God sees me. That he, he sees you. He loves you. He, he calls you his kid, his child, and he doesn't hold those things against us. Well, if you want to know more about this organization, I want to encourage you to check out OpengateIntl.org, Open Gate International. Hey, thank you so much, Deidre Pujols. What a joy it was to speak you, with you today. You. And thanks for encouraging people today who feel like they're, they're out of the kingdom. You're reminding us that God loves us all. Yeah, I, so, I'm just so grateful to be here and that your church is sharing this kind of information. So thank you. Amen. Thank you all so right. much. <laughs> Appreciate you. are so happy that you've joined us in worship today and we hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Several years ago I began practicing the Creed of the Beloved by saying it aloud each day and now it's become a vital part of the walk that I have with the Lord. 
Though simple, these words have changed me from the inside out and given me renewed vision, joy, and energy. Every week on Our Power, we recite the creed, which says, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me, I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it away from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. And that's the truth, dear friend. By resting in the Lord's boundless and unconditional love, you will experience the fullness of his blessings. When you embrace your position as his beloved child, you will be empowered to step into your true identity, to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow his call on your life. Though it's not magic, practicing this creed changed the dial on my life one degree at a time. While I didn't notice like a huge difference at first, as I regularly trained and aligned my mind with the Word of God, I developed a deep sense of rootedness and contentment. And I believe this can happen to you too. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we want to send you this Creed of the Beloved bookmark. As you meditate on the truths it contains, we believe it has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. Write to Hour of Power, New Zealand, P.O. Box 26209, Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. You can tap into the energy, power, and joy that comes from living in the kingdom of God when you walk every day in your identity as His beloved. As always, we're extremely grateful for your friendship and we're continually praying for you. God loves you and so do we. Would you stand with us? We're going to say this creed together as we do every single Sunday. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Holy Spirit. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. I remember, I believe it was 1994, our family was living in the valley in Los Angeles. And it was in the early, early morning hours, maybe late evening, maybe two in the morning, something like that. And all of a sudden, there was a brutal shake that came from nowhere. It started pretty small, like a tremor, and then it turned into just a goo, boo, boo type thing. And it was a major, major earthquake, what would later be called the Northridge earthquake. Lots of buildings fell down. I believe a couple hundred people died. I don't know if that's right. But I know a number of people did uh, die. And I know for me as a kid, I was maybe 12 years old, 13. It was a, a kind of an experience I'll never forget. At the time, my parents, my stepdad and my mom, and they still do, by the way, had a real estate appraisal business. And after the earthquake, there just was no work. Something happened to the real estate market where nobody was getting loans for a while and very few people were buying houses and there was some kind of a weird shakedown where I remember just they were getting no work at all. I remember we were lucky, my mom said, if once or twice a week they got an order and an order would, would only be about $200. Order means an order to appraise a, a, a property. After a couple of years of really bad and sometimes no business, lots of nights of potato soup or breakfast for dinner or these types of things, uh, our family, as many families today are doing, left California to try and find a, a less expensive way of living and to find a better place to live. And we moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And this was in uh, 1996, I believe. It was interesting because the other day, maybe like, well, like about a year ago, I heard my mom refer to the first couple of months we were in Tulsa as homeless. I didn't experience it that way, but when she said that, it really struck me to think, I guess in a way we were. We bounced around 
in motels. My, my sisters and I, my mom, my stepdad stayed back here in California. And it was just right before we moved, I've told you this story before, that I had made a personal decision to follow Christ. Now, I grew up in a Christian home, and obviously my parents, you know, my dad and grandparents are, all my whole family is Christian, but for me in that season of my life as a teenager, it wasn't a personal thing. It was a label. And I had made a decision just before then that I was going to follow Christ. I didn't go down to an altar call. I didn't pray a prayer. I just sort of sitting in my chair at a convention, actually, I went to with my family across the street from Disneyland at the Anaheim Convention Center. I just made a decision. I'm going to follow Christ. And it was only not that long after that that we moved. When I look back at that season of my life, those first couple of months when I was in Tulsa, I feel very fortunate that according to God's providence, Satan was not able to pluck the seed that God had put in my heart. And he very easily could have. I didn't find gangs. I didn't find drugs. I didn't find a skateboarding crew or some of the things I was actually looking for. I found a youth group. And it was just the exact youth group I needed. It was called 180. It was the youth ministry for Church on the Move. And I believe at the time might have been the largest youth ministry in the the world or in the country. When I went, there were easily 2,000 kids every Wednesday. I still remember going into this youth group. The building was actually almost a half a mile from the church itself. It had its own big, big building. And I remember walking in... And seeing the most amazing thing ever, I thought, this is a church? The first thing you saw was big industrial cages with guys playing three-on-three half-court basketball in the cage with referees. There was a DJ up top playing, it was Christian rap music, it was still music, you know, it was cool. There was an arcade and a pool table and pizza and food. And half of them were girls. And half of those were pretty. So it was, a, it was a, an awesome thing for me. And I remember just feeling like instantly I was getting sucked in, like I belonged. They instantly started to draw me into things. Like I became an altar counselor. Altar counselor, if you don't know, means like in some churches you'll have an altar call and people will come down to receive Christ. And then there will be another person of the same gender that will stand behind them. And then afterwards they'll go into another room and pray with that person and talk to them about what it means to be saved. I had no business being an altar counselor. And they made me one. And they had me do all these other things. And and it just instantly felt like I had a purpose. I had a calling. But most importantly, they never asked me if I believed the right stuff. They never asked me if I drank or did drugs. I didn't, but they never asked. They They didn't ask anything about my past. It was just the second you got there, you belonged. And I believe, and I want to make the argument today, this is precisely, precisely how churches ought to be. Not just with teenagers, but with everybody. That the question we ought to be asking ourselves is, how can we make someone, when they're with me, not just when they come to church, but when they're with me, get a sense that they belong, even though they may not believe or behave or do the things that I think they ought to do or think the things that they ought to think? How can they get a sense of belonging from a person like me. Well, today I want to talk about so the hands of a servant leader, the hands of a servant leader. When you look at somebody's hands, you can tell a lot about them, actually. In this picture behind me, just looking at these pictures, you can know a lot about these four people, or five people. <laughs> One is probably a farmer or something, some kind of a laborer. Another, maybe a well-to-do girl that just got her nails did. Another's a kid. There's a couple of corporate business people making a deal. You can, it's weird how you can learn a lot about the hands because the hands are a reflection of what a person does. When you see these hands, you see what we're supposed to do. Now, the hands of God, through a Christian lens are hands that are pierced. Hands 
that are crucified. When we think about what it means to live a life and to serve and to lead like Jesus, we're asking, what do these hands do? We all know about the cross, but we may not know is that these hands did a lot more than just sacrificing themselves for our sins. These hands healed, and these hands reached out, and these hands touched the ones that were not supposed to be touched. These are our rabbi's hands, and no servant is greater than his master. We're supposed to do what the master does, and the master breaks the rules in order to reach the lost. What do you mean he breaks the rules? Well, he does exactly that. He had rules he was supposed to follow, and he broke them constantly, and it's actually fun to watch. One of the most famous, I've talked about this a lot, is the account of Jesus healing a leper. Now, in Levitical law, a leper, remember in Jesus' day, not only did Jesus have the Bible memorized, but kids would grow up in a school that was built around Bible memorization. So most young people, especially the boys, would have the first five books of the Bible memorized. And in places like Leviticus 13, there are 59 verses, the whole thing, where when you're memorizing it, it would take probably several weeks to memorize that one chapter, you're saying to yourself, the word of God, lepers are unclean, lepers are unclean, here's how you treat lepers, here's what you do if a leper touches you, here's what, what you do when a leper comes into your community. A leper can never get out unless this happens or that happens. So imagine every single person in Israel has memorized this and learned this. And they know that you cannot touch a leper. That lepers are outsiders. If you touch a leper, you yourself become unclean. And it's like you touched COVID-19. You, you have to go away for seven days. You have to be uh, you know, inoculated. And, and so... Or isolated, rather. And so Jesus, seeing this leper, who's an outcast and unloved, he cries out to be healed. And the Bible goes out of its way to say, first, Jesus touches him. Jesus himself becomes unclean like the leper. Isn't that great? I know I've talked about this before, but he touches and becomes unclean himself. And the man is instantly healed. And Jesus tells him, go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering. Uh, Jesus touches the untouchable. And Jesus eats with those who are not supposed to give hospitality to. He eats with the outsiders. Samaritans were for sure outsiders. They were the half-brothers, half-sisters of the Jews. They were considered heretics because they had a Samaritan Torah. That wasn't the Jewish Torah. It was a little different. And a Samaritan temple, not the Jerusalem temple. And they hated each other. If you went into Samaria as a Jew, you, there's a good chance you'd be murdered or robbed and vice versa. If a Samaritan came into, into Judea, he'd be assaulted. So they hated each other, like, like two clans fighting. But Jesus ate with Samaritans. You're not supposed to do that. Eating with someone is like calling them an honored guest. It's like saying they're a family member and they come under your protection and they belong. Jesus ate with insiders, the Pharisees, the pastors of the day, the ones that weep think are the bad guys of the Bible, you know? Jesus certainly has some harsh things to say to them, but he still eats with them and honors them and spends time with them and teaches them. But most shockingly, Jesus eats with the sinners. That's really not something you're supposed to do with the prostitutes and the tax collectors. And maybe we could say the gang members and the drug addicts and the cussers and the drinkers and the swearers and the, and the violent and the whatever. And he eats with them. And one of the most shocking ones is the story in which Jesus uh, meets with Zacchaeus. If you have your Bibles, you can read it with me. Luke chapter 19. It says, Jesus entered Jericho. So Jericho is a wealthy town on the border of Israel. It says, he was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. 
Now, I think I've told you this before, but you know, a tax collector in Jesus' day is actually a bad guy. Samaritans, lepers, they were not actually bad guys. Tax collectors really were. In the Roman world, when they occupied Israel, they employed Jewish tax collectors to collect taxes, right? And one of the things they would do is you could, as a tax collector, know the secret amount that Rome is charging, and then you yourself add a little extra, just a little bit of, little bit of dough, whatever percentage you wanted on top of that, and that's how you took home your own pay. So, for example, let's say the set amount was 10%, and you were going to make it 12%, and that's the little, like, you know, the little extra little smoochy smoochy you're going to take for yourself. And everybody knows this. And so they're saying, you're scouring me. He's like, oh no, this is this, I know that I, I'm not taking any. And you have this negotiation. So tax collectors went around. They were not only seen as thieves because they would arbitrarily take whatever they could from you, but they were also turncoats in a time in which Israel wanted Rome out. They're raising money for the Romans. So Zacchaeus, isn't just a uh, tax collector, he's a chief tax collector. That means he's the one who sets the extra amount. He's the one who is in charge of all the little guys that go around, you know, knocking on your door, asking you to, to, to pay up. He is not a good guy. He is for sure a thief. He's for sure a bad guy. And the Bible says he was a chief collector, tax collector, and he was wealthy. How did he get wealthy? Well, not honestly. He wanted to see, he, Zacchaeus, wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Do you guys know the song? Who, who here knows the song? Should I sing it for you? I'm not going to. But just trust me, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. In the first century, the average Jewish Middle Eastern person was about five foot one. So if those people say that he was a wee little man, we're talking hobbit tall he, or short. He was not, and, and in, this was also in an era where even more so than today, there was a real prejudice towards little people like this. So he was this little guy, and it says, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up to him and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people that saw this began to mutter, he has gone to the guest of a sinner. And boy, were they right. Let me tell you something. For Jesus to, one, invite himself is already like a surprise because you're kind of not supposed to do that. It's like now if I was like, hey, can I come over to your house for lunch? It's like, oh, okay, you know, but this is a little bit off. But two, to invite himself to this person's house, I said it this way once. Imagine that Billy Graham came to your town, you know, and you lived in a small town or whatever, and there was a gathering of famous amazing people, and let's say, we're just going to throw these names out, let's say these people are still alive, and in the crowd to see Billy Graham is Dr. King, and Mother Teresa, and maybe Dr. Schuler, or maybe some other person you really admire that you think has done a lot for people, is, and, and Billy Graham is looking for someone to invite to dinner, and in the crowd is also Bernie Madoff. But Bernie Madoff in this story got away with it. Everybody knows what Bernie Madoff did, but because he had the right attorneys, he was acquitted and got out scot-free and still has all those people's money and hasn't paid it back. And Billy Graham looks around and he's trying to find who he's going to honor with today's meal. Who is he going to spend time with? And looking past Dr. King and Mother Teresa and your favorite holy person that everybody loves and admires, he goes, Bernie Madoff! I'm eating at your house today. That's how shocking it was to these folks. They're looking at Zacchaeus and going, that guy stole my grandma's medical money and she couldn't get her pills. That guy, do you, Rabbi, do you know what that guy has done? 
Are you serious? You're going you're gonna to eat with him? Let me tell you something. Okay, so what's Zacchaeus' response? <laughs> Obviously surprised. It says, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. By the way, that is, that's what the Torah requires to thieves. If you steal $10, you have to return $40. Jesus said to him, Salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. You know, Jesus Christ is the smartest person who's ever lived. The reason he did it this way is because it works. It actually works. It's practical. It's wise. Can I tell you, how many people do you think beg, banged on uh, Zacchaeus' door over the years? Zacchaeus, you son of a gun! <laughs> you son of a gun! You robbed my... F you pay it back now! I'm going to murder you! We're coming for you! How many times do you think that happened? And you know what Zacchaeus' response was? Almost every time, I guarantee you. Go pound sand. Am I right? And here, a righteous man looks at Zacchaeus, and all he does is say, Hey, Zacchaeus, can I eat with you? Can I spend some time with you? Can we be friends? I am so glad that in a room of perfect pastors, of great achievers, perfect parents, amazing people, Jesus would look at me and say, hey, Bobby, can I eat with you? Can I spend some time with you? It's so easy in life to not only feel, but know that I am not up to snuff with so many great people, or I am a sinner, or I am an outsider. But even then, Jesus just looks at you and says, hey, can I come to your house today? Friend, I can tell you, there is no powerful, there's no more powerful or more beneficial or more practical way to turn a heart than that, than to say to someone, you belong, you matter. You old goat, you're my friend. I'm on your side. You see, there is an incredible power in belonging. And can I just tell you that Satan knows this. Satan knows this. And this is one of the greatest ways that Satan is stealing our kids, our teenagers. If you go into Los Angeles and downtown and you see these gangs, you will see these kids who very often grew up without a dad, who found a community that even though they kill people and sell drugs, and even though they're rough, this community has a set of rules, has a way you can get respect, has a way that you can be in and a way that you can be out. And when they point to those kids and they say, you belong with us, you belong here, those kids find a home. As a pastor, I have seen how hell uses the power of belonging to seduce, in particular, young people into lifestyles we would never, ever think they would be a part of, simply because it's the place where they feel the most belonging. Whether it's gangs or drugs or prostitution or any of the other things that you think of with your niece or nephew or, or your friend's kids or you or whatever, or looking back on your own life when you did those things, you know the power of belonging. I remember when I was in high school and there was a young girl that came to faith, she told me, Bobby, I'm, she's like, I'm giving up weed. I'm not going to smoke weed anymore. And she came to me and she said, 
But I gotta be honest with you about this. I feel sad about it. It's something I really enjoy. Not just the weed, but I really enjoy sitting around with my friends, sitting in a circle and telling stories and smoking a bowl. But I'm gonna give it up for the Lord. See, what I could hear in her voice is she knew she was giving up one place where she knew for sure that she belonged to go to another place that she wasn't sure if she would belong. She'd never been there. She was trusting that the kingdom of God would be a place where she would find friends and love and kindness, even though she doesn't know the doctrine of the Trinity, or even though she hasn't read the Gospel of Luke, or even though she might still have some, some seed burns on her legs. She, she wants to know that there is a place where she belongs. This is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus, the hands of a servant leader, are the hands that touch the untouchable, that say, not only I love you, but you belong here. You're home. Can I have a meal with you? Welcome. The gospel is a message that sinners are touched by grace. Grace means that you can't do it through your works. Grace means you can't save yourself. So what I believe is not only the right way and best way to do ministry as a person uh, and as a church is to make sure people know what Jesus taught us, that you belong before you believe, you belong before you behave, and you belong before you become the person has called, God has called you to be. And this is what we learn from Zacchaeus. That even someone like Bernie Madoff can find a home in the kingdom of God. Bernie, if you're out there, I want you to know God loves you. And so do I. <laughs> that would be cool. Send me a letter if you saw that. Well, this is my final question. I'll just kind of close with this. I want to ask you, who are, who are the untouchables in your life? Many of us, we're quick to think of the obvious untouchables, and these, these may be untouchables for you. We often think of the gang member, the drug dealer, or the homeless person, or the prostitute. We think those are the untouchables. But I just want to challenge you very gently to think realistically about who's truly an untouchable in your life. See, I know this church, and I know, and I know the people of God. I know, I believe, that for many of you, it's, it would be much easier to spend time with a homeless person than it would be for a kid that's a part of Antifa. For some of you, it would be a lot, it would be a lot easier to, have, to spend time with a drug dealer than it would be with a Trump supporter or a Biden supporter or a racist or any of these other villains that in your mind that you think are villains, right? I'm not calling, I'm not calling anybody a villain. I'm just saying that in life, we become very tribal, where we feel like there is, some, there is some type of political person on the right or the left that we just, that, that is your untouchable. If you're even hearing one of these things, your fist starts to, to, to get tight. That's the untouchable. Maybe you're not into politics or you don't really care about any of that. For some of you, it's at your workplace. There's a competitor Maybe somebody who's in your same market that's, that's outselling you or is trying to outsell you or somebody who's, who's trying to take your position. You know, you both are vying for promotion and only one of you is going to get it. And you feel like they've been playing dirty tricks. Or, or maybe, that, that, maybe that's not dirty tricks. You just, you just can't get yourself to like them. Or maybe it's a mean neighbor whose dog barks all the time and poops on your lawn. And how many times do you have to ask him to stop parking in front of your driveway? or dumps his trash on your lawn, or it's too loud, or maybe it's the kids that, you know, next to you that are always having parties and drinking on your lawn. You see, I think the true untouchables are those, these kind of folks. It's the kind of person that if a friend of yours helped them out, loved them, or was kind to them, you would feel betrayed. You would feel like, how could you do that? I thought you were my friend. I thought we were kin. I thought we were family. How could you support that person? How could you love that person? Do you know what they believe? Do you know what they do? Do you know what they did to me? 
They're trying to destroy this country. They're trying to destroy my church. They're trying to destroy my business or our company. They are no good. You see, in the kingdom of God, all that stuff, whew, right out the window. That's where it goes. We let God sort those things out. We can judge good from evil. We will judge right from wrong. But at the end of the day, I want to be like Jesus. And I want to look at the person in that tree and say, can I eat with you? And that's what kind of people we are. And that's what kind of person you are. You're not a bitter, angry person. Right? We're not going to hold these things against people when we, when we disagree with them and, or when we think they're bad. We love people just as they are and, help, and we understand the power of belonging. Nothing turns a heart like the power of belonging. Learn from the story of Zacchaeus. Pounding on the door and saying, Zacchaeus, you jerk, you robber, you lowlife. That will get you nowhere. We learn from the Lord. We learn from the Lord. That when we love people, we're also understanding and remembering that he loved us even when we, we didn't have it all together. He loved us even when we weren't right about everything. And so, friends, I want you to think about that. And I want you to know you're doing better than you thought. And for those of you who feel like you are an untouchable, maybe you're watching on TV right now. Maybe you feel like I would, nobody would ever. I remember I had a friend once. I invited him to church. He said, I can't come to church. My horns will get caught on the door. I know there are people that feel that way. I want you to know that that's the best kind of person sometimes, that, that Jesus can use someone like you, uh, not only to, to live a healthier life, but to change the world. And so I just want to encourage you that God loves you. He does call us to be different. He calls us to change our behavior. He calls us to, to act differently. But at the end of the day, he loves us before we behave, and he loves us before we believe, and he loves us before we become the person he's called us to be. Father, we love you, and we thank you for grace. We pray for a country. There's a lot of anger and fighting, a lot of confusion and deception. It comes from every side, in all directions. We pray for our family members and friends who disagree with us on, on things. And we thank you, God, that we have friends and that we have family. We pray for our neighbors and our competitors and even sometimes our enemies. Thank you that our enemies can show us what our friends can't show us. And we pray that you bless them and we forgive them. And Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that you'd forgive us in the same way we forgave them. And to the same degree that we forgive them. And we ask, Father, that you fill our hearts with compassion and mercy and kindness and peace. We ask it all in the very strong name of Jesus. Amen. Hannah and I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today, and we hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Several years ago, I began practicing the Creed of the Beloved by saying it aloud each day, and now it's become a vital part of the walk that I have with the Lord. Though simple, these words have changed me from the inside out and given me renewed vision, joy, and energy. Every week on Our Power, we recite the Creed, which says, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me, I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it away from me. I don't have to worry, I don't have to hurry, I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. And that's the truth, dear friend. By resting in the Lord's boundless and unconditional love, you will experience the fullness of his blessings. When you embrace your position as his beloved child, you will be empowered to step into your true identity, to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow his call on your life. Though it's not magic, practicing this creed changed the dial on my life one degree at a time. Well, I didn't notice like a huge difference at first, as I regularly trained and aligned my mind with the Word of God, I developed a deep sense of rootedness and contentment. And I believe this can happen to you too. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we wanna send you this Creed of the Beloved bookmark. 
As you meditate on the truths it contains, we believe it has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, PO Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. You can tap into the energy, power, and joy that comes from living in the kingdom of God when you walk every day in your identity as His beloved. As always, we're extremely grateful for your friendship and we're continually praying for you. God loves you and so do we.